It's a special honor to have uh, His Royal Highness Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed with us. It's interesting given the fact that there is a common trope about Christian Muslim debate that Islam and Muslims are fixated on the question of law, why we Christians, especially we Protestants, are obsessed with notions of love and grace. And to hear from an eminent Muslim intellectual to speak so wide and with such depth about the issue of law, love, I thought it would be appropriate as a Christian theologian to speak a little bit about law. <laughs> One of the most fascinating parts of the Common Word Declaration is a passing comment at the beginning that Christians and Muslims will not agree on certain issues. Of course, central amongst these are the Trinity and the incarnation of Jesus, as well as the prophethood of Muhammad. But there's also a brief reference to the issue of law that I find fascinating. As Professor Siddiqui mentioned, my forthcoming book is precisely on this issue of law. More to the point, the issue of Sharia which for Christians and Westerners in general seems to be the great boogeyman in all Christian-Muslim dialogue. But it's interesting that law and love are not nearly as separated as we Christians have made them. If you recall, when Jesus is asked what, who his neighbor is, he tells the famous story of the Good Samaritan and ends with the statement that love of God and love of neighbor are that on which all of what? The law and the prophets hang. That is to say, both law and prophethood are intricately tied up with love of God and love of neighbor. Far from being a dichotomy, love and law are intricately woven together, not only in the Islamic tradition, but also in the Christian tradition. I want to reflect very briefly on some of the ways that love and law might not be thought of as opposites, but as mutually reinforcing uh, tools on the journey towards God. I think one of the biggest problems for Christian understandings of law is that, as uh, Prince Ghazi mentioned, there is a tendency amongst Christians, especially Protestants, to think of law as something that merits God's favor. Law as something that puffs up religious pride. It is, of course, as Prince Ghazi mentioned, a common human problem. The tendency to grab on to our achievements as a source of our identity, to cling to our legal or academic or professional or familiar achievements as a source of pride and identity. And law, especially religious law, as we know, can also be this kind of ballast that we cling to. And yet it's interesting in a closer reading, not only of Paul or Augustine or Thomas or my favorite, uh, or not my favorite, but one that I look at a lot, John Calvin, it's not so much law itself that is the problem. For law remains a divine gift, something given and something that will, in fact will never pass away according to Jesus. It is the human disposition to use law as a source of identity and achievement that becomes the central issue. In the Islamic tradition, no one has explored this more powerfully or more poignantly than Abu Hamid al-Ghazali in his, uh, in his uh, revival or resuscitation of the religious sciences. He starts the book in the introduction by saying he is going to frame it like a book of fiqh, like a book of law so that the unsuspecting student picking it up, ready for their exam, thinking this will take them through proper Islamic law, will be ensnared and accidentally find themselves on a 40-chapter journey towards God. All throughout, Ghazali probes the question of law. He realizes that it can be a source, a tool for the religious authorities to use. He recognizes the way that it can un or falsely uh, lure people into believing, that it can uh, hide the real problems of the heart or the qulb, that it can deceive you. 
But rather than law ever being jettisoned in the way that we Protestants often do, Ghazali argues that instead the law needs to have life breathed into it. One continues to practice the law, and yet one practices the law with an intention to, of the heart. And ultimately, in the 36th uh, book or chapter, with an attention to the love. And there he writes that love must come first. And only then, in its aftermath, does he who loves obey. Here is one of the greatest Islamic intellectuals, poets, leaders, arguing that it is love that comes first, not law. But that love produces a willingness to obey and follow the law. In fact, one can see here an echo with the Christian scriptures, especially the various epistles from John, where John says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That love of God and the obedience to God, but not only to God, but to one's neighbor, are intricately woven together. Now, of course, this isn't saying that Christian visions of love and law are the same as Muslim ones. For there are important distinctions to be made about the understanding and place of law in public life, the ways of law in ritual, but it is a deconstruction of some of the assumptions that we have. One of the great invitations of the Common Word document is to avoid these sorts of attempts of interreligious engagement that paper over differences. I'm not going to speak ill of the Parliament of World Religions. It has its place to have a meal together can be productive. But if we're going to have a deeper understanding between Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, secularists, atheists, it isn't going to come from papering over our differences or pretending they don't matter, but finding ways to go deeper into our particularity, but in a particularity that is cracked open to our neighbor and to others, is open to interreligious learning. It's on this point that I think we might turn as Christian thinkers to think a little more clearly and fulsomely about the issue of law. Law not simply as that which God demands of us in order to earn divine favor, but law as a gift of divine life. And of course, law moves out of the individual pious issues into issues of the public. It is here that some of the most interesting, contentious, and even death-dealing debates happen. For we often know that law fails to live up to its own aspirations towards both love and justice. And yet, I'm reminded of a obscure and yet important, not that obscure, important reformed theologian and legal thinker, Johannes Althusius, in his book Politica in which he argues that public law is meant to ultimately be a reflection, not simply of justice, but of the struggle towards equity between human beings, that again continually reforms itself and refines itself based on the criteria of what? Love of God and love of neighbor. Or in the words of Cornell West, who was just here last week for the Gifford Lectures, love is meant to be enacted in justice. Justice is what love looks like in public. So it might be that thinking more deeply about questions of justice, of law, are not ciphered off from the questions of love and of piety, but are brought together in in-depth conversations and debates about what we expect not only from religious law, but of our public sphere and our struggles today, as you know, in Christian-Muslim relations, and more broadly, to have our public laws reflect our desires for equity, justice, and dare I say, love.